Hi, everybody. Great to see some faces on a Friday lunchtime. Thank you very much for joining us. Really appreciate it. I'm Jemima Burrell, and I'm the curator of Now Gallery and the cultural consultant for Greenwich Peninsula. And that's kind of why I'm here today, because we've got some really interesting things happening on Greenwich Peninsula. And for someone who doesn't necessarily like being at home, I have to say it's been so lovely to get back to work and back to the gallery and also to see to see the design district which is what we're talking about partly today evolving in front of my eyes um, as the gallery is next door to it. So there are going to be 16 buildings designed by eight architects and I think it's a sort of space for London's creatives to work in and what's lovely about it is it's really being thought about and made in a really considered way. So I've been talking to some really interesting architects these, these last months. It's been a real education. And today is no exception. We have Adam Khan here with us today. Hello, Adam. Um, whose buildings have been described as modest and sophisticated. I can't remember where I read that, but I thought it was a good, a good quote. And I can also see from the models that we've got um, of his two buildings that he's designed for the design district. They're somehow very simple, but incredibly smart. And they're understated, but also rather, I mean, slick's not such a great word, but they are very kind of beautifully slick. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing these. I mean, they are actually materializing kind of before my eyes, uh, which is very exciting. Um, so I think it's good to see that we're working to give people alternative office space. And um, so this is our, um, this is the eighth talk, I think. It's, is it the eighth talk, everybody? I can't remember. I think it's the eighth talk in the series. Um, and it's been a real joy to learn a little bit more about the design district's ar architects. And I feel lucky to work somewhere that is really experimenting and giving architects the, um, the opportunity to maybe bring a sense of themselves to a project, whilst also addressing the important questions of how we want to work and how workspace can work. Um, and just in case you don't know the format, I'm going to ask Adam about eight questions and I think he's got some images that he's going to share with us. But most importantly, we really want you to be involved in this um, talk. It's always, I feel a bit lonely here and we really wanna know that people are interested and have questions and we'll put those questions to Adam at the end. So please, please, please get on the chat and start giving us some questions as soon as you'd like. We'd love that. Um, Adam, are you, if you could share your screen, that would be great. So um, my first question to Adam was um, covering, a, it's a rather, it's not even a question really. It was like covering a building in a wrap. Does it disguise or does it dress it up? Um, your buildings show how decoration is important in your designs. How is the materiality of buildings important to you? Oh, that's a really good question. I think I think it's probably not disguised. It's probably I like the idea of um, um, yeah, dressing up is probably better, as in a kind of really conscious act of what you choose and and the different codes and, and meanings that dressing up involves. Whether you know whether you're actually slumming it or kind of really dressing up in a fancy way, you're, you're so attentive to how um, uh, the codes and messages and meanings of what you're using and. And the materiality of that is is really incredibly important. I suppose I really like this image that's on the screen. If you can see these ladies in their veils, and it's I like it because it's full of um, interesting kind of paradox and richer than the usual sort of simplicities of like truth to materials. Because you know this is a, evidently a single material, but it's completely transcending its its material to be this other thing, this other illusion of of these beautiful delicate veils so there's a kind of virtuosity of the craft in there um but there's also this 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 really lovely play between sort of illusion and reality and something in phys physically embodied but actually you know spiritually alive and all those kind of crazy things that that exist in in the way we read objects and the way we you know we inhabit ourselves and our objects so that's a long answer to a fairly simple question well no no I don't think it is I think that it is it's it's about when you look at a building what do you see and what does it tell you by what it appears to be 
and looking at your buildings, it seems that you give quite a lot away on, from the outside of a, you seem to give quite a lot away from what a building looks like from a, um, the outside in a way that maybe other architects don't necessarily do. But also going back to your design district buildings, in a way they are, I think it's the fact that they, they appear to be simple, but they aren't necessarily simple. And, and you have a real feel for materials and that, that materiality and looking at a building and what it looks like is really important. Yeah, I think that's right. I think there's, there's such a responsibility of architects to, you know, make buildings that other people are going to, it's not just the client that's going to see them, it's people passing by for, you know, years, decades, maybe hundreds of years. And um, so this act of display is a kind of act of generosity to the, to the city, to the public, um, is really incredibly important. And it's bigger than what's going on in the building. So there is a dichotomy, there is a sometimes a need for a building to be a civic you know, just a thing of great beauty. And maybe the inside is tougher and it's, um, you know, of a different character. So I, I guess, you know, you've made me think about this, but actually there's a kind of often quite a dichotomy between the outside and inside of the building. I guess, um, I mean, we can, you well, know, let's... we've just completed, yeah. No, no, I was just going to say, I mean, if you think about, it's obvious, but if you have Doric columns outside a building, you know, it becomes a bank. I mean, the, the sort of signifiers, I think it's interesting there are signifiers of buildings. And I, I was interested into which, in terms of the buildings that you've done, what do you, how do you flag up what they are from the outside? I mean, obviously you walk in and it becomes immediate what the building is, but from the outside, how do you signify what a building is? And that's really interesting because it used to be kind of really clear um, uses, like you say, it's a, it means a bank and now things are a little bit more fluid. I mean, um, I mean it was interesting putting these images together because this is the first project that the office ever did and it was for a library in Stockholm and it's a long time ago, this is 2006, but, um, you know, it is this kind of idea of a really exuberant gift to the city around it and a certain kind of display so I don't that won't tell you it's a library but it will tell you that there's something fairly important going on in there something that's shared and communal and kind of joyful um there's a kind of celebration of that rather than being a functionalist thing and then I mean this building for example the, the, the one we showed when you get in it's tougher and it's more like a, a warehouse or a factory or something like that um and then this, this is a building that's just recently been completed. And again, this is a school. And it's not necessarily that it tells you that it's a school, but it has a certain kind of exuberance and pleasure about it. And a kind of, I guess, a joy of, of, it, of, of, the, of, the, uh, of the program. And, and colour, I think, is quite important to you too. I was, I mean, just even this, like this hint of red on this building. I mean, but again, looking at this building, it could be a church, it could be a school. It's interesting, the sort of identifiers of what, as an architect, you bring. Um, and I think those beautiful, this, the, 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 the way you've actually sort of cut out the shapes in the building, the sort of, the, um, that it's not, that architecture is also about the space that you leave behind, that you're not kind of constantly filling in. Um, and I wondered how, how you approach that in this building, the idea of the kind of negative space. No, it's a really good, really good observation, actually, because, I mean, this building is a kind of um, really a pair of buildings with a pair of courtyards between and but they but it's unified by this um, park. I mean, it it's going to face onto a park. And so this facade that knits them all together is a bit like, you know, an older palace or a kind of 18th century kind of, uh, you know, house in Paris or something. So it's got a it's got a formality to its. Um, the way it presents itself to the park and to the city. It's not just stuck behind a fence and a kind of uh, ambiguous defensible zone. It's clearly, clearly presenting it. So it's, those are the buildings we look at, things like palaces, which, you know, interestingly have gone through a number of different uses and have been banks and schools and universities and dance schools and as well as, you know, the home for a, for a very wealthy person who built it. So, um, I guess it's that element of the kind of civic and the kind of exuberance uh, that is that seems to be the 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 enduring thing, and the program of the building might change. But um, 
I think it's all about also about making sure buildings are kept, you know, because we buildings have multiple lives. And the way to be really sustainable is to have a building that you don't need to pull down to build it again. It's going to last there. It's going to be there for hopefully hundreds of years. And and what protects it is people's pleasure actually in reusing it. So actually, this kind of idea of an aesthetic um, sustainability is is really critical. I think so. If it's a beautiful thing, people will look after it and they'll find ways of using it. And there are obviously there's got to be a you know, nice flexible space as well. I, I think the idea of aesthetic, aesthetic sustainability is such an interesting idea. I have a friend um, called Polly Hudson who runs something called Colouring London and it's all about how cities change and what gets knocked down and why and why new things are built. It's I mean, totally fascinating. Um, but also I loved on your image. In fact, we were hoping that you could actually change your presentation to full screen. That would be really helpful if you were up for doing that. Um, um, I just think love, so, yeah. yeah, yeah. We'd, love the, we'd love the whole thing if that was possible. But it said is that, something Is that about, better? Yeah, but no, little, no, I think you need to do full screen somehow. You. Um, if you, I, the, uh, the the only uh, slight technical glitch that it's it's programmed with auto timing, so it will just keep on rolling okay. it along. I don't okay. know. I don't know how bad that is. I can I can try. <laughs> It'll be. It might be a bit of a random surf if we do that. I can do it. Uh, oh, just I love it. If you put your um, cursor on the photo, the most fantastic thing comes up. Did you realise this? It says an upside down castle. Did you see that? Oh, sweet. That's, that's very nice, isn't it? This is kind of AI kind of attempt to understand the um, yeah, yeah series, tr series trying to read the building and um, it says oh, a castle down. on top of the building. Yeah. How great oh, is that? Uh, that's so random. Where's, where's, where's the upside down castle? I, can't find a it. Castle. I hope everybody can see that. Clap if you can see it, the upside down castle. because there's A castle on top description um, automatically generated. That, How that's perfect. good. That's good. Oh no, it's finessed itself to, no, it probably realised that a car, an upside down castle was too weird. That's great, I love that. Yeah, I thought it's, it's so perfect. And actually also that kind of, it hasn't very oriental. It feels, it, it doesn't feel English. It feels from another world in that way that, yeah. I mean, it could be built out of sort of brick or, I mean, uh, out of kind of mud <laughs> or something. It's, 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 you know, it, the, the it's nice you say that. It's nice you say that. I mean, but actually, if you look around the rest of the, its its locality, you can find plenty of swoopy bits of brickwork, um, arches and fen and um, boundary fences and schools. You know, um, Edwardian schools with um, arch bits at the top. So you know, that's nice. That it's nice you say that. We look at a lot of buildings that are. Um, um, I think I guess our favourite book is Architects, Architecture Without Architects, and so. Yeah. Ah, so this is the crazy thing of this glide screen is going to have a world of its own mind of its own now. So that's the interior <laughs> as the model shot. So you can see it's kind of big. It's quite tough in a way. It's like a factory and all the children inside it are really small. It's going to be for children that are kind of four to uh, 10 years old. And I think we like that discrepancy of scale and it feels like a generosity. I'm just going to let this go through. So that's the that's the classroom, um, and then you know this is a kind of documentary that was done by Lewis Kahn, who's a photographer we work with a lot. This was before they got there into their building, and I so that's you know what it, that, it was the Louis Kahn um, those ones in um, the Fondation Mecht, that whole. Yeah, that's that wonderful art, which is so fantastic. There was definitely a... Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, they're amazing. Yeah, well, yeah, no, that's, that's, that's sort of great. And then just see if we've got a photograph of... Yeah, so while we're, while we're on the schools, there was a question which I wanted to ask, which was really um, understanding about collaborative working methods. And I sort of felt like rather like sustainability, we can all band those words around about, uh, you know, how we'd, we really would like to kind of consult with people, but actually, how do you do it effectively? And I know that you did it for the Horizon Youth Centre. Um, so the question was just about, yeah, collaborative working methods and whether you talk to teachers or to students to be able to design a school. How, how do you know how to design a school? And also with your Absolutely. Horizon Youth Centre, how that worked? 
Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely important, those kind of dialogues. And um, it's, you don't know what you're going to learn when you start. So you just have to kind of have a kind of open, very open kind of dialogue. And the biggest thing really is often to just change the whole tenor of the conversation, you know, from being um, something that's about, you know, when we started working on New Horizon Youth Centre, it was for young homeless people. And rightly so, the, the staff were very concerned about safety of young people who, you know, uh, often, um, you know, prone to self-harm. So the conversation was about, you know, stopping people hanging themselves and stopping people getting clonked over the head with lamps and escape buzzers and things like that. And, and you think, well, you know, this is fine. With these are things you've got to attend to. But actually, if the conversation continues like this, we'll end up with a kind of group for security kind of designed you know, um, kind of institution. And I, think, well, I think as a practice, we're very interested in the relationship between the institution and domesticity, between the intimate and the and the institutional. And so what we what we brought to that conversation was, OK, we, we understand all those things. Let's talk. Let's bring in the idea of home. and What does home mean uh, to an institution like this? And that was an it was a kind of thing that people could all rally around. Everyone, no one, you know, it was a, a way of building consensus. Everyone could contribute to it and say, you know, for me, home is a place where you can sit and read on the stairs. So maybe you have, you know, places of unexpected generosity like that and then you start working through those things and you find that actually you can accommodate all the safety things you can you can you can tuck those in you can make them work and the sight lines and things you can make them work um but you're you're you've changed the conversation to a to a much more generative conversation um where people can input input things i mean you know some some surprises you know i mean i had no idea before that that young homeless people would be very keen on gardening you know i just assumed that would be the kind of last thing on their mind and that you know had a lot of other urgent things to sort out but actually when you think about it i mean what an amazing way of um rooting oneself um and just connecting to the earth for a moment when you're in this midst of this terrible business of being homeless so you know surprising finds like that and also very surprising level of um articulacy uh, if that's a word, um, being articulate about how public space works. So precisely what it means to have a fence at a particular height, that means someone will be dragged behind it, or unfortunate will happen. At what height does it mean that other people are looking out for you and, you know, bad things won't happen? And, and when you think about it, you know, the kids that are living on the street have become, unfortunately, absolute experts in how urban space works. So, you know, uh, so there's this huge reservoir of actually of of um it's like sadly but of knowledge about kind of how the public space works so actually you can as soon as you tap into that this huge reservoir of of um of, of of very precise knowledge and it's not it's not specialized to young homeless people it's about how space works for us all but I so think i guess it, that's that's you know I think it is about the questions you ask. I remember doing a project with the Architecture Foundation in Newham. And, you know, you can ask leading questions that are very unhelpful, or you can ask questions that people really want to answer, or you can ask questions that are going to end up with a positive answer or a negative answer. And I think that it's, it's that which is kind of key. It's what, I think, what it seems to be about your practice is it's about being curious, really. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, and also, and also, also recognizing, yeah, curious and open, but recognizing one's responsibility. So, and not to ask, you know, just indulge in fantasy, or lead people along to say, let's all just dream about whatever we want and draw, draw whatever we want. There's a space for that. And there's a moment for that. But there's also a kind of power to actually focusing and saying, okay, we're here, we're looking at the height of a fence. What does that mean? And actually, then you spiral out from that single thing, which was the dimension of a height of a fence, into loads of other really pertinent issues that people can actually get perched on. So it is kind of framing those conversations so that they, they, they have, you know, they have meaning and they have um, efficacy. People can actually affect the outcome, you know, generally materially, rather than just lots of 
slightly empty, lovely sketches of swimming pools in the sky and things like that. So um, it's it's yeah, it's a quite a careful curation job, I guess. But at the fun, you, you're right. It's curiosity is at the base of it, and a pleasure in that knowledge that comes, and, and pleasure and surprise. I mean, we don't get out much, so it's nice to meet people, you know, who've seen the world a bit more. Yeah, I mean, listening and hearing for sure. But I also wanted to pick up on the idea of unexpected generosity, which you talk about, because I think that's a really lovely phrase that that a building can be unexpectedly generous is 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 a really beautiful thing that you walk into it and it makes you feel good. Is that what I mean? And also you talk about home, you know, is that what we're all looking for in, in buildings is, I mean, certainly for the design district, you know, work is home from home, isn't it? So how do you create that working environment that feels like home? Yeah, that's right. And obviously that's become so much more criti critical as home and work get blurred and, you know, with, with working from home and, and what, what we're probably going to completely reset what we expect from an, from an office space. Uh, from that so that's a really interesting time actually for office space so I think the the losers will be those really you know hard cold generic spaces um, but the ones that who have who have attended to some idea of um, how it is to be somewhere um, will yeah will benefit hugely I mean this is because uh, this is the interior of that uh, play group and they've just moved in and I guess some of the things I like about it as it's it's way too tall I mean it's way taller and that gives it immediately a kind of a, a strange generosity it's very robust it's made of concrete you know so you're not quite sure whether it's a kind of gallery or a huge great loft or a garage that's been repurposed and then there's disparity of scale between these little people and these big things but it does feel extraordinarily generous and, I'm, and i guess in that in that sense you know this is not um new if you think of the victorian board schools they are hugely generous with their big swoopy tall uh, windows and ceilings um, but then there's you know moments of domesticity like this this moment you can see um, in the background a slightly more intimate moment and this is designed as a little stage and a little reading corner but you know moments where you could you know sit at the window still and um, hunker down with a book and look out of the window so change of change of rhythm change of atmosphere is very important so it looks all big and tough, but within within that sort of toughness, there are you know moments of softness, and then this kind of found space. This um, effectively this mezzanine up here, you can just see behind the glass, where you know they've instantly installed a big puffy sofa, which is great. So they've you know they're making themselves a nice little nest up there. It's really good. Well, I think it's it's true. It's like you said about um, sitting and reading on a on a step but sometimes you don't want to sit and read on a chair you want to sit and read by the window and it's it, it, as a building it's being flexible enough to know that you don't have to place people in a you don't have to say now this is where this goes and this is where you know that actually buildings can that's be absolutely flexible. right yeah that's absolutely right and i think the you know just going back to the new horizon youth center that was such a nice clear object lesson in that because teenagers you know they don't take any um you know they don't take being told what to do and so you know when we visited lots of other centers they would have the you know the the chill out room or something and it was just full of great big puffy sofas and so one the kids were being told where to go to chill out and the two they were being told how to chill out and not surprisingly those rooms were empty and completely um, lifeless so actually there are teenagers a fantastic case study in um and it applies to all of us as well you know it's 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 about we we like making our own opportunities to make ourselves at home we like finding those a nook and making ourselves at home like literally um so how can an architecture be a set of um prompts and supports for that rather than rather than doing everything for everybody um, which which you know as architects we often want to do we want to create the whole the whole thing you know as uh you know my teacher florian bagel used to say um you should be creating the rug not the picnic you know the picnic is going to be brought by other people and it's going to change and it's going to be more magnificent than you could ever imagine but 
make a good job of doing the rug so that they've got somewhere to have the picnic. That's a really lovely, yeah, that's a lovely analogy. Um, so one of the questions I had on my list, as I seem to be going a bit off piece, I wondered if you, so you have, you have got building, um, you have got um, obviously photographs, of, have you got photographs of the Horizon Youth Centre or you haven't got those on this particular Oh no, I haven't, I haven't got anything on, no, no, no. No, that's fine. Um, and this was a sort of total, yeah, away from this, but was just thinking about, um, I asked you, whether you, I mean, you're featured in, in the French AA about fabulous Britain with Morag and um, Yinka, Laurie and various other people. And I was sort of just curious, I mean, I suppose I, I don't feel very, I don't feel very fabulous about Britain at the moment, but I wondered whether, you know, whether Britain is a fabulous place for an architect to work in. Um. Yeah, I think it is. I think it's a fabulous place to work in. And obviously there's loads of things that one could um, uh, moan about. And there's lots of colleagues in other countries that seem to have it a bit easier in terms of the reception and the kind of knowledge about architecture and, you know, the prestige it's held in and the, and the budgets that they get and everything like that. So there's, 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 there's plenty of justified moans, I guess, but actually Britain's an amazing place to work. And you know, when you go a bit deeper, it's got this set of really, really interesting um, dynamics and contradictions, which really energize the thing. So, you know, the openness and tolerance to um, other cultures, um, you know, literally the welcome that, you know, my dad found safety here as an immigrant and, you know, for which I'm eternally grateful. Uh, and then the contradiction of that and the racism that he suffered and, you know, the impact on his life and it made him effectively die young and unhappy. Um, you know, so th those, those are some really powerful kind of contradictions, um, but which are incredibly energizing, I think, and makes and does make England, uh, I'd say particularly London, because it's what I know better, um, a really yeah, a really dynamic place to work. And and yes, there's loads to solve and it's it's only getting bigger the amount of stuff to solve and it's not getting easier. But um, yeah, but it's such an energetic um, place, I think. I was wondering if we could possibly, maybe we should just go, if you haven't got any more images, I didn't know how many more images because we haven't gone through Oh, this I've got, yeah, I've got some of about design district. Great. Okay. Well, let's wait. That's cool. I was just going to say okay. maybe we should come off the yeah come off and have images. I mean, ah, ah. But let's let's keep it there. I haven't quite got to design district because there's a couple of other things <laughs> I want to ask you about. Um, and the one the one I think you might have talked about earlier, but it was just about the first thing you designed. Was that back? Was that because it was really what I was interested in? I was thinking about architects and that you have to learn so much along the way. I mean, you literally have to, you know, you go from designing a building, you know, when you first start, and then you design something however many years later. And I wondered the process of understanding how to improve, how to, how to think about things with, with that past knowledge. Um, and obviously you've just shown us the photograph of the library. I wondered if that was the example of of something that you designed first, and then thinking about how that's how that's informed what you do now. Yeah, no, that's a that's a good question. I mean, you did ask about the first building, so that's why I kind of stuck it in the slide. And we don't, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about the um, progression or the you know the earth. I mean, we we follow uh, Mies van der Rohe's dictum of uh, build first and talk later. So we. You know, the idea was to, um, uh, you know, do a certain amount of buildings and then do the thinking rather than, you know, a lot of other people prefer to do it the other way around, which is totally respectable, you know, to think it all out, to have a program and then and then to kind of affect it in a, in a series of built works. And uh, I guess we just don't work like that way. Um, but um, but it is interesting but I don't to, to kind of drag up the, the, the first building and you see so many um, consistent uh, themes, you know, you see it's like we're just doing the same thing all over all the time, all over again. Um, so it is it is really interesting to actually start dragging out some of the older uh, projects and see, I mean, I think the relationship between the Stockholm library with its 
kind of exuberant facade and and it's sort of tough um you know very civic facade and then it's tough factory like interior i think that's a completely uh, uh, in this building which is a school um but you know with its with its with its interior so and i don't think that was consciously done uh, i think it's just a process that you could probably find in quite a lot, quite a few buildings and also maybe there was this there's this one about a kind of an attention to atmosphere and the way materiality uh, makes atmosphere so this is a house uh, you know a private house out in bath um but it's just it's just that sense of ordinary materials like breeze block and this wood wall insulation quite functional in sense but it's not about rubbing that functionality in your face it's it's about how it can create a kind of soft atmosphere so those are those are really consistent themes that just 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 keep on recurring i guess but i thought there might be within something the, the idea that every project is taken as a completely fresh thing really I Sorry, somehow no i just i had this sort of image that you know you come across door handles by somebody in the first project that then you'll use the same door handles all the way through but i'm sure it's it's just not that mundane architecture in that way oh but no i wish i wish we were efficient and sorted like that that would be really that would be really smart i mean it's it's more of more haphazard actually which more it's, it's much less worked out i mean which is um it's more like taking each project and thinking it from first principles and and you try your hardest to think of it from first principles but there are just things that are always i guess um approaches that crop up and and it is it's probably time now we've been going for years you be a little bit more um a bit more um articulate and explicit about those relationships so you know the Mies thing of building first and talking later i think that time later has probably come now and we we probably do need to um start being articulate about it I mean, one thing that just just to go back to that, you know, you mentioned about the kind of fabulous Britain, um, uh, you know, art, um, issue of the AA uh, or Architecture Georgia Wee magazine. What what I think it was really cool that they were picking up on was the, um, you know, the building Britain better, the beauty commission that that um, you know was, um, um, Roger Scruton headed that beauty commission, and. And they were picking the, the French magazine were picking up on that, saying, "Hold on, there's a government talking about beauty, and and it's all these amazing kind of designers working and doing these exuberant things, and those people in Britain aren't putting the two together. So the building Britain beautiful agenda or whatever is absolutely the right thing to be talking about. Fantastic that we're all talking about beauty and how that can be curated and funded and progressed, but the but the beauty that they were referring to was um, in a very limited range of beauty and actually quite normative and potentially quite reactionary, um, but still beautiful, you know, um, but it's just that they hadn't found a place for all this, you know, um, for all the Inca and stuff like that, you know, which is, which is the current beautiful things that are happening. So I thought that was really smart of the, of the French magazine to, to pick that up. Well, also to put all those sort of blocks together. I mean, obviously, I don't think anybody wants to necessarily be part of sort of a clan, but it is, as you said, it's an interesting, it's an interesting, I mean, it's about aesthetics as well. And what is beauty anyway? And for some people, it can be, you know, a brutalist building and others, it can be, I don't know, a, 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 a pink tea set. I mean, I just think that it's, it's quite a kind of, it's so loaded, as I think you're saying, um, the whole idea of what, what beauty is anyway. Yeah, but I mean, I think that's absolutely it. But I think we absolutely should be talking about it. I mean, we, you know, when we set up, we put, we put, you know, our aim being beauty on, um, you know, we declared that. And and it's weird that it's almost a dirty word for some yeah. architects yeah. to use, um, either because it's been taken hostage by certain people or it's too complicated or it's too varied. But I mean, really, you know, but I think number, it's number one on the job, isn't it? Yeah, but I mean, I think absolutely. I think it totally is. And I, But I also think I come from... Um, an art world as well and that at the moment there's a there's a total look at figurative um, painting particularly very beautiful figurative painting which I haven't seen for like a long time and I think that people are 
people need that now just walking around and seeing galleries um, during freeze and you can go in and you can see artwork which is such a total pleasure and you don't have to see it all on viewing rooms which does my head in but that you are seeing stuff which is about it is it's about beauty it's and it's about um yeah having the opportunity to really enjoy a painting and I think that actually in architecture you want to be able to enjoy a building yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And obviously beauty is a completely incredibly loaded subject because of power and wealth and exploitation and whose whose view of beauty has it been. So it's it's absolutely incredibly loaded. I can understand why people don't want to go there. But really, um, one should. And you know, and that's I think it's turning that round to the agenda of building, also having a bigger agenda than just the client. However, you know, the client is super important. Um otherwise the buildings wouldn't happen and they're super important in making sure it happens well but actually there's a bigger agenda than just the client's immediate agenda there's the agenda of the city the rest of the people the next 50 50 years let alone climate change and all that so there are some there's some really big responsibilities and um and it's kind of a way of making sure you've you've kind of delivered on that i think yeah, I think it is. It's about responsibility. So I had a question for you, which was, um, I always speak to Matt Dearlove, who's the head of design for Greenwich Peninsula. So he he gets to talk to all the architects. I'm rather jealous of him. He gets to have he get, gets to have chats with everybody. Um, and I always have a little discussion with him before I do a talk. And he said that you, um, he said that, uh, yeah, he also sort of comes up with these nuggets and he described that you were, your process is very playful and that you were, arrived at a presentation with a model, which you kind of was some blocks, I think it was sort of some objects balanced on one top of each other. And then you said, oh, well, I'm just going to turn them around and have them the other way around. And I just sort of was wondered whether you always work so unconventionally, because that's quite a kind of, it could be this way or it could be this way. Well, it's really nice of Matt to to remember it that way. It shows what how you know, I well, it was an amazing client to think like a designer like that and not to be freaked out, um, you know, by that process. It it kind of it's I think it's testament actually to his kind of understanding of design. I mean, but look, this was an upside down castle we're looking at, right? So yeah. So even even Siri thinks it's an upside down castle. Uh, uh, no, no, I think it's I think. Um, the playful element is important. I mean, it's it sounds corny, but it's a collab. You know, all these projects are collaborations, whether they're with the amazing engineers that work on the buildings or with the clients. It is a collaboration, and to make that collaboration work, you know, to be creative together, you need to relax a bit. You know, it's no good. Um, there's loads of things we all don't know, so it's good to just chill out about that and 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 make it fun and playful and. And design is a process of, of really, you know, non-linear kind of discovery. And you do discover things by the most odd things. And, you know, it can sound, it can sound unusual that a building, you know, you'd solve it by turning it upside down. But actually, that is the weird loveliness of, of architecture. And I think, you know, when, when a client has a really sound knowledge and, you know, understanding and love of architecture, you know which matt does you know he lives and breathes it so you can you do that um but i think when clients know less or they're less confident maybe they get you know obviously it must be really scary dealing with all that money and all that creating so so you know i think that knowledge and intimacy with architecture leads to a confidence which can actually help the, the design teams be confident and therefore feel playful because it's not mucking about it's it's just actually a playful process which we know from children and and scientists is is a very efficient way of generating new knowledge i think yeah play is uh, generating new knowledge is yeah essential i think it just gives you an opportunity to think a bit wider which i think is you know what we all want to do now i was thinking that we've got probably another 10 minutes so what i would love you to do is literally to talk a little bit about the two buildings that you're doing for design district that would be great and then we're going to have i think we've got about three questions from people thank you so much for getting those on the chat that is brilliant um so if you would and yeah it was that my sort of question was i know you you're doing two very different buildings and one of them is on the um, Silver Town Tunnel. 
and has to be lighter than the other that is obviously can be whatever you know whatever weight it, it can be and um my question was are they siblings or friends are these two two buildings sort of related or are they just hanging out that's a really really good question because they did start as two um you know definitely two siblings two concrete buildings look series thinks it's um a large brick building that's what it's flagging up on my screen. Anyway, this very large concrete building. Um, so this is this is the concrete one, and it's got a concrete kind of exoskeleton. So its structure is kind of on the outside as in situ concrete. The other one was going to be the same. And then, as you say, Silvertown Tunnel is potentially going to be built underneath. So the building had to be lighter. So we we had to change radically, and and we investigated what we what what was then. Um, there because there was a kind of formal relationship between the two buildings and what would it mean for one to be really heavy and one to be really really light and not just you know technically we've reduced the weight a bit but what would lightness mean in terms of kind of the experience of the building in terms of optics so I mean this is the concrete one and it's got this eternal exoskeleton um, of concrete and I guess this was um, and this is a model of that and I guess we used to fairly fancy in situ concrete buildings, but the idea of this one was that there were so many fantastic um, concrete frame uh, contractors working in the Greenwich Peninsula, putting up all these buildings, that even when they're building a car park, you know, the concrete is beautiful. And, and so we were kind of looking at those things. And, and I mean, here's, here's one of the concrete contractors. This, they were just making a car park, no architecture here at all, but this chamfer on the edge and this, this kind of little recess on the corners that were gonna take reflective stripes. We just look at that and think, ah, oh, this, is, this is beautiful. What a, what a way to articulate a column. So, and, and Again, the same as that, you know. I was thinking about the National Theatre and I'd always loved the shuttering that's left on the, 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 the imprint of the um, wooden shuttering on the, on the National Theatre. And it's a thing that gives me such pleasure. And I suppose, is that, is it similar, is that similar idea? That you're, yeah, you're no, no, absolutely. Them. Because they, and you know, they looked. Sorry. You know, it's just no, that, showing your process. I mean, you're showing that this building doesn't just arrive from out of space; it's made. Yeah, absolutely. So that kind of clear the reading of the construction is something we find very pleasurable and, and somehow super calming. Somehow, in a world that's full of pretense, where everything's built of lots of things who knows how your ipad works i mean it's all just magic isn't it and you know most buildings are made up of layers of thin fragile materials actually to sense what something is actually made of is a rare kind of pleasure like being standing next to a cliff or something i mean I, and i guess the shuttering it was one at one time it was the the you know the practical cheap way of doing things and architects got inspired by that that has since become a rather fancy bespoke way of doing things so it becomes rather precious. And I guess we were interested in, in this, okay, these kind of ordinary things that are being used in car parks, how could they be part of a part of an architecture? So this is a little mock-up panel where you can start to see those sort of chamfered edges, things that have directly come from how they make car parks and little step-ins. And and there was a practical element to it as well. We thought rather than having to get some really fancy bespoke concrete manufacturer, why can't we use the, the people that are making all these concrete frames and just get them to do the building? So, you know, that was the idea. Um, that's the interior of that one. And then the building, the dimensions. How, does, how do you translate that then into a building of, of, of lightness? And, and I guess, you know, the building becomes a steel frame. It has kind of timber cladding. But then how, just by paint, by really thin, by the thin application of paint, how can it have another life? And so yeah, I guess we thought of kind of optical illusions, the kind of dazzle camouflage from the First World War that inspired lots of op artists. And, you know, um, and this is basically the colors of a TV set. Just, it's just red, green, and blue. So it's the colors you get on the, well, you used to get on an old TV. And how can that become something kind of shimmering that will really change as you come up close to it and from a distance it may blend all into into kind of a single kind of white color and you know and then they they shift slightly as the building so you might have noticed the concrete building steps out a little bit as it goes up 
and how does that translate to this one? Then maybe there, maybe these are now like little phase shifts in the color, so it will it will zing even more. Um, so that's that's the, that's its kind of formal. Um, oh yeah, and this is this is this is sweet. This is you know this is found on site. I think this is one of our first site visits, and it's just I guess this is the only closest we get to having a kind of diary really of just observing occasional nice things like this. I mean, this is this isn't an artwork. It looks like a Daniel Beren, but it's um, it's just someone on site making sure you don't trip over a box. It's just incredibly beautiful. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> so yeah, that, so it's a kind of translating that. So I think so. The answer to your question is they are still related. I think maybe they're like a couple, a kind of odd, a kind of a nice odd couple, a contrary couple, you know. There's clearly relationships. I mean, they're never, you're never going to see them directly together. So it's a slightly special, it's a slightly, you know, there's, there's our interest in the fact that we're making these two buildings together. The people will walk around and see one and then see the other. And so they might figure out those two relationships together or not. I don't know quite well. But I guess for our internal stability of composition, there's a nice thing about them being a pair still, uh, but it feels like more like they're a very, yeah, a contrary couple. Yeah, I like the idea of them being a contrary couple. Now we've got some questions, which I'm hoping Alex is gonna read out for us, if that's okay, Alex. Um, thank you very much for everybody who asked some questions. We'll try and get them all to Adam right now. Go for it, Alex. Hello, Adam. Um, we've had a question from Stella and she's asking, how did the design process change in designing a project for productive workshops? And I'd like to add another question to it. Did you envisage anything? Oh, any pardon, sorry, one thing, one thing. Could we possibly um, stop sharing the thing so we can see Adam properly? Could you, would you mind stopping sharing this? That's perfect, thank you. So yeah, we were, Stella asks, um, how did the design process change in designing a project for productive workshops? Okay, yeah, that's a really good question. I think what was really, um, you know, one thing was really good about the clienting process, well, lots of things were good, but one of the things is where the client was very clear about their parameters from the outset. So it was, um, you know, here's what we want to achieve, here's the floor space, wall to floor ratio, now go and now go and be as creative, you know, complete creative freedom. So that was very interesting. That's that's different from a lot of processes where you all dream together and then you find out you can't afford it, so you have to chop it down. So there was a very well organized process to allow that creative freedom for a start. So I guess one knew what it had to do from the start. One knew that it was um, workspace. Um, but I guess we we're quite familiar with kind of artists working spaces having designed not just galleries but people's own studios and working spaces for artists so um we felt quite familiar with that kind of the the what makes a building flexible and what makes a building a pain in the butt to use you know like what what things give it a flexibility for and actually there's something about kind of it, it almost comes back to domesticity. You know, we have lovely pictures of artist studios where they have their, you know, little plants on the windowsill and it's a working environment. But you don't want to be in somewhere that's like a kind of metal B&Q shed or something. You want to be in somewhere that feels like you can work well and comfortably and the sill height is comfortable. And so there's a kind of domestic element to it, to attentive to the fact that people are actually spending a long time there. There's an element of just raw you know flexible functionality to it so um i guess it felt interesting because it was a way of um re reinventing or not inventing but evaluating what office space was you know because we don't really like the generic kind of typical office space and the work of the future will be far more mixed and fluid and flexible between you know, things that you do with your hands and things that you do with a computer. So in a way, it's the future. Architects, uh, artists and architects are just sort of, you know, early adopters of that in the way they work in studios. So this felt like a good model for the 
for future workspace, not just because it was going to be full of painters, but because of it was going to be full of a whole unknown set of future working conditions. So it felt really an interesting brief in that and it's more than just creating a studio or some, someone. It really felt like it was poised in that in that space that had to that had to be workspace, comfortable, but super robust, super flexible. I think that's a zone we find very interesting. You know, it's, it's the sort of zone you find in good warehouses that we all like working in. So it's not so unfamiliar, actually. You know, ceiling heights, good ceiling heights, the occasional moment of double height, the occasional moment to get out to a balcony and have a cigarette if you're so inclined, you know, things like that. You know, who wants to be in a building where you can't open the windows? I mean, it's terrible. So, um, you know, th our usual things of thinking, like where do you go to have a cigarette? I don't even smoke anymore, but I mean, I'm still worrying about the person and where they're going to go and have their fag. So, um, but it, they're useful little touchstones to make things uh, make things human, you know, where can you go and see someone out the window and where you can talk to someone on the ground floor, you know, from, from your high window. So things like that. So that's a whole kind of, yeah, I don't know, waffling on a bit now. There was a, I think it's that, I like the description, it's like robust and, and refined. It's got to be sort of both things, hasn't it? It's got to be robust enough so that you can kind of get around it, but refined enough so that you feel kind of elegant and comfortable in it. It's sort of, it's yeah. fine. Yeah. Alex. No, I, Next question, because we've only got, we've got five minutes. Okay, this is actually a question from me, if it's okay. Um, and it's, I'm very lucky in that I'm the person that's showing potential tenants around the design district. And I was lucky enough to go into your building earlier this week. And I've been intrigued looking at the floor plans about what's happening on the first floor of building a3 which is the concrete the really robust one because you've got a kind of double height unit in there with a that's mm -hmm. linked by a, by a spiral staircase what was the what was the thinking behind that did you did you envisage any particular type of kind of creative use for that um yeah i mean I, i'm just going to actually just share the screen for a moment because i haven't to have the photo of that in front of me so this is looking at that space looking at the big window with the balcony and just ahead you can see a double height space so you know there's a moment for this where you know maybe one of these units wants to be a bigger entity maybe it's a bigger organization or it's a bigger collective of people um it doesn't have to be a big organization it could be actually this is one that's more about individuals working but sharing something bigger so you know whereas most of the rest of the in the rest of the building there are these obvious you know half a floor you can take half a floor maybe this one is uh, suits a bigger or a collective and has a bigger moment it has a kind of moment of collectivity and then this balcony actually looks out into the central square of the of the um of the development so it felt really important to mark that moment where these buildings are clustered around a central square and actually one should be addressing that a bit like the balcony or whether kind of the royal box or something like that. But there was this moment when this building internal should look look out back out to the um, square and celebrate that. And and similarly from from the outside. I don't know if I've got it here, but um, similarly from from the outside, that moment is really significant. That this is the moment. This big double height window that actually. Um, one sees from the from the square so a kind of change of rhythm there and a change of proportion because it's appropriate to that bigger scale of an urban square which is a, in a larger scale of collective so um that yeah that's i guess that was that's that's the thinking really to to enable this different type of flexibility but also this relationship of the buildings to to its urban collective Okay, we've got one last question, if that's all right, Jemima. Yeah. And it's one that we ask all the architects on this. And it is, do you, what, what is your favourite design district building that you didn't design yourself? Oh, oh, that's, that's, uh, that's like asking a mum which kid they love most, isn't it? <laughs> like, like um, you know, um, it is actually really exciting. I mean, it's going to be really great walking around them all um, when they're built. And it's and it's. I think what's interesting is that, um, you know, Matt and his colleagues when they started the process, um, there was you know it was a great master plan by assemblage, um, but they 
the clients said, we don't want you getting together and also all doing groupthink. Actually, we want you to just do your own thing and uh, we don't want it all going beige, you know? So I thought that was terrific, uh, a terrific thing to say. And, and it's been interesting because then actually we can't help but relate to other buildings around us. We just, it's just, it's just normally kind of what we do. And it, as other ones appeared, it sort of strengthened our resolve that this concrete building should be the rock, you know, that actually just, as we saw other ones, buildings come up that were lighter weight, you know, more expressive or, you know, fruity in their kind of um, expression, that actually there was a place for this kind of boulder at the middle of it, this sort of tough, tough, ugly guy. Um, and that actually it might offset the kind of beautiful, more ephemeral light waves like the Cell Gas Cano and the 6A one that's next door. And um, so I'm, I'm avoiding asking your answering your question, as you can <laughs> see. There's no avoiding, um, and we've got like no, no time left, so I'm gonna cut you off there. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think they ask, I have to say they ask this every week and I'm like, please don't ask it because they're not gonna be able to say it. It's like literally, it's like a filmmaker has to choose another person's film. They're just not going to do it. But that, you know, there's. But what comes out of the question is always quite interesting. So thank you. Um, I want to say I noticed there were a few people like Carl and who whose questions we didn't manage to answer. But I hope and SR. So I'm hoping that um, you'll forgive us and come back and ask ask it again with another architect. But thank you so much. We really appreciate those questions. It's really important to us and they're they're really useful. So thank you. Um, I would just like to say thank you all for coming and joining us on a Friday. I hope you have an amazing weekend. I just have to flag up that we've got David Saxby on the 23rd of October, so that's two weeks time. He's the last person. I'm going to really miss doing this every two weeks with some really interesting architects. It's been a total joy. I have to find something else to do. Um, so that's at one o'clock on the 23rd. And they're from Zero, Architect Zero Zero, who've got a basketball on their, on their building. So that's quite exciting. And finally, a big thank you to Adam. That was a really Really, I really enjoyed really interesting conversation, really interesting ideas. I'm going to go off and have to write them down. And I thought actually the whole idea of a non-linear discovery is brilliant because isn't that what it's about? And that kind of, you know, like darting around and, and, and finding interesting things along the way. So thank you very much for coming and joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure.